Hello, and welcome to this series about building a batch platform on Kubernetes. I'm Murphy, a developer advocate working on Google Kubernetes Engine, focusing on batch and AI platforms. I'm Ali, and I'm a solutions architect at Google. I partner with Mofi in helping our customers build high performance and batch platforms on Google Cloud. In the previous video, we took a look at what Q is and how it works. In this video, we're going to look at a hypothetical scenario where Q can be used to build a batch platform on Kubernetes. So this is what our setup looks like. We have four teams of researchers that want to use a shared Kubernetes cluster to be able to run their machine learning workloads. Teams A, B are in a cohort together, meaning that they can share each other's unused quota. And team C and D are also in a cohort, meaning if team D is away and not using their quota, team C can learn run larger jobs or more number of jobs to get their workloads done quicker. We also have a regional GKE cluster with nodes in three different availability zones in that region. Let's head over to the cloud console to take a look at this GKE cluster. Here we can see our cluster. Our cluster has four different node pools. The default node pool has all the system pods that is not relevant to our machine learning workload. But the three node pool we're interested in are the on-demand node pool, the reserve node pool, and the spot node pool. The reserve node pool uses our reservation. When possible, we should try to use the reservation because that gives us the best price for our committed usage. For on-demand and spot node pools, we spin them up when necessary. On-demand being there for high priority workload and spot running on preemptible low priority workload for cost saving purposes. So let's take a look at what we're gonna to deploy to this cluster. In order to represent the real world teams inside Kubernetes, we're going to create namespaces and service accounts for each one of our teams, A, B, C, and Next, we need to install Q onto our cluster. To install Q, we can find the latest instruction from the Q documentation. Links to that will be in the description below. Once we run this command, Q will install all the necessary things it needs to run on our cluster. This means a bunch of CRDs, RBAC rules, and the deployment, which is the Q controller manager that is the application running on our cluster controlling our queuing mechanism. We can see all the resources installed with queue by running cube control, API dash resources, and grep on queue. We will see a number of different resources. The ones we are most interested in and will be controlling are flavor, local queues, and cluster queues. Let's take a look at the queue configuration that we're going to apply to this cluster. First are the flavors, which represents the kind of resources that exist on the cluster. First is the GPU L4 reserve flavor that specifies the GK accelerator of NVIDIA L4. It has a system supplied label of GK provisioning standard and a user supplied label of resource type reservation. This represents reserved virtual machines that exist in your project and are part of your GKE cluster. Next is the GPU L4 on demand flavor which also has the same GK accelerator and provisioning flags, but the resource type is set to on-demand. This represents on-demand virtual machines that will spin up to field your workloads as they come in. Next, we have the GPU L4 spot flavor, which also has the NVIDIA L4 GK accelerator parameter, but you'll notice that the GK provisioning has now changed to spot. This is going to let GK know that we want virtual machines that represent this flavor to use spot as the provisioning mechanism, meaning that they can be preempted. Lastly, we have the GPU A100 compact spot flavor. You'll notice this time we're using an NVIDIA Tesla A100 GPU. You'll notice that the GK provisioning is set to spot and the resource type is compact. This flavor is going to be used for workloads that require low latency communication. So their pods are scheduled on machines that are physically close to each other. Next, we take a look at the cluster queues we're going to create. For each team, we'll be creating multiple of these cluster queues. So let's take a look at team A. For team A, we create CQ team A LP, which stands for low priority. And one key thing here to note here, that team A has a cohort of team A-B. We said earlier that both team A and B are in a single cohort. That means they can use each other's unused quota. In this case, 
We have a covered resource type of CPU, memory, and NVIDIA.com slash GPU. This is the types of resources this cluster queue is covering. This cluster queue has multiple flavors defined. Flavors in queue are order. That means they are read top to bottom when time comes to fulfill those flavors. In the first flavor we define is GPU L4 reserve. For our low priority workload, we do not define any nominal quota for any of the reserved instances. We can see that for CPU, GPU, and memory, we have zero as our nominal quota. But we do have a borrowing limit. That means when there is no high priority workload running on our reserved instances, the low priority cluster queue can borrow those resources to run the workload. The fallback and the actual quota that is defined for low priority is the GPU L4 spot. When there is no reserved quota left, we will create these spot instances, which we have a quota of 12 CPU, 48 gigs of RAM, and 12 GPU. We also create a local queue for our team A. In queue, you interact with a cluster queue through a local queue, which is a namespace bound resource. In this case for team A, we have LQ team A LP. For the high priority workload from team A, we have CQ team A HP. We can see it is still part of the same team AB cohort. We have a new field defined here called preemption, which we didn't have before. What we're saying here is that the high priority cluster queue should be able to preempt the lower priority cluster queue workload to make space for more high priority workload. In your team, this might mean jobs that are more time sensitive or jobs that are more business critical gets to go on the high priority cluster queue. Here, we also have multiple flavors defined. GPL for reserved, we actually have nominal quota for in our high priority cluster queue, and GPL for on demand, which takes on the overflow work for the high priority workload, and they spin up standard VMs on our GKA cluster to take care of the workload. Here for team A, there is a second local queue that is gonna interact with the cluster queue. We have a pretty similar setup for each of the other teams for B, C, and D with low priority and high priority cluster queue and local queue. Next, we have the CQ Team A Compact Cluster Queue. You'll notice that this also exists in the Team AB cohort, and it also specifies preemption rules. However, in the covered resources, you'll notice that their flavor specified is GPU A100 Compact Spot which means we're asking Q to make evaluations for workloads that are asking for NVIDIA A100 GPUs in the Q. You'll see that there is a 20 CPU nominal quota along with a 120 gigabytes of memory and two GPUs. This flavor is specifically used for a use case where workloads require multiple A100 GPUs to be physically placed close to each other for low latency communication. We spoke about preemption earlier, in Kubernetes, priority and preemption are handled using concepts called priority classes. Let's take a look at them. Priority classes are Kubernetes objects that represent the relative priority of a workload compared to other workloads that exist on the cluster. In this case, you'll notice that we have a priority class called default priority non-preempting with a value of 10. With priority classes, the higher the number, the higher the priority. The preemption policy for this priority class is set to never, meaning that workloads that specify this priority class should not preempt other workloads. Also, this is a global default, meaning if there is a workload that doesn't specify a priority class, it will inherit this one by default. Next, let's take a look at high priority preempting priority class. You'll note that the value is 20, higher than 10. So this will preempt lower priority as set by the preemption policy. It is not the global default, meaning you have to explicitly specify this priority class in the workload specification in order for that workload to take this priority. Last, we're gonna take a look at the compact priority preempting with a value of 15, which also will preempt lower priority workload if it needs to compete for the same resources. Before we start sending any jobs to our cluster, we can see that all our different cluster queues have pen zero pending workloads and zero admitted workloads. At this point, we are running no workloads in this cluster. That will soon change where we start generating a bunch of work for our clusters to handle. To simulate all four teams sending jobs to this cluster, we can create a bash script that sends one job from each team at a time to the cluster until all four teams have four workloads running. Speaking of, 
let's take a look at the job itself. We start with a headless cluster IP service, a job pattern that we spoke about in a previous video, link in the description below. Next, we have a config map that contains the actual Python program that we're going to run as a part of this batch workload. In this case, this is a Python program that trains a machine learning model on the MNIST dataset that will allow the model to recognize handwritten numbers. Next, we have a job definition. We see that we're sending this job to namespace team A with the name team A low priority job zero. We have a labels, and we remember from the previous video, that's how Q knows which jobs it should be controlling the resource for. In this label, we define the local queue this job should be going to. And this local queue knows which cluster queue this local queue belongs to. Here in the volumes, we use the config map defined in the previous step that contains the code this job is going to execute. The actual container has this image of PyTorch GPU 1.12. When the job starts, we use the torch run CLI to start the execution of our job. We define our request for CPU, memory, and our limits for our GPU, which is set to two. And we set the restart policy to never. For our node selector, we want this particular job to run on any node that has a GK accelerator of NVIDIA L4. So let's go ahead and run the script to create these jobs. It's going to create 16 jobs in all, four from each team. As the jobs are being created, let's take a look at a previous command that we had been running. As we can see, all 16 jobs have been created on the cluster. This is also reflected in the cluster queues. As you can notice, the admitted workloads for each one of the team's low priority cluster queues is set to four. Now, this doesn't mean that all four of now this doesn't mean that all 16 of these jobs have already begun. As the team submitted their low priority workloads, not all of them are going to be able to fit on the reserved instances. So there will be a subset of them that will land immediately on the reserved VMs, but the rest of them will remain unschedulable because the resources for those uh, workloads don't yet exist on the cluster. As our four teams send their jobs to the cluster, only a select few will be able to immediately run on the reserved uh, VMs that exist on the cluster already. The rest of them will not find the resources in the cluster present, but this is where Kubernetes comes into play. Kubernetes' auto-scaling functionality will automatically scale up the node pool that these workloads are destined for. In this case, since these are low-priority workloads, it will trigger scale-up in the spot node pool in addition to the already running reserve node pool. Let's go back to our terminal and take a look at our Kubernetes nodes. We have a watch loop going that looks at the number of nodes in the cluster. And you'll remember that we started this demo with 10 nodes, six from the default pool, four from the reserve pool. But now you'll see a number of these spot node pool machines showing up. These are the VMs that GKE was able to scale up to field these incoming workloads. And if you go back to the cluster in the user interface, you can see that scale up represented as well. Now let's imagine a scenario where our team starts sending more high priority workload. In this example, we're using the same exact workload, but imagine a workload that is more business critical in this case. So the moment our team starts sending high priority workload, the first thing that happened because of our preemption rules is that we kick off the jobs running on a reserved instance to make space for our high priority workload. But eventually, we're sending enough job for the reserved instance to not be enough. That's where Kubernetes scaling comes in, and we scale on-demand instance to handle those workload. At the same time, we will see the jobs that got kicked off from our reserved instance have quota for uh, spot flavor. So we'll spin up more spot instances to handle those jobs. So let's see that in action. We create 16 high-priority jobs with their corresponding config map for their code and their service for the inter-pod communication. The moment we do that, if we take, go take a look at our cluster queue, we will see that new high-priority workload starts coming in, and the admitted workload for low-priority workload goes from 4 to 3, and pending goes to 1. These workloads will then get rescheduled on new spot instances that gets created by Kubernetes. You'll notice there are a couple of pending workloads under the high priority cluster queue. This is because we tuned the nominal quota for on-demand VMs for these kind of workloads so that we would only have a few of them running in on-demand at a time. Next time 
this pending workload is going to be evaluated by Q for admitting, it might actually end up in reserved instances, which will be more cost effective for the platform. We can also take a look at the nodes. You'll notice that we started with 10 nodes total with six in the default pool and four in the reserved. Now we have a number of on-demand nodes that have come online to field the incoming high priority workloads, as well as the spot nodes that we saw earlier that are currently running low priority workloads. Let's take a look at our job page to see the status of the running jobs. Now, while our low priority and high priority workloads are running, there could be a situation where we want to run some compact workload. As Ali mentioned previously, these are workload where we want low latency network communication. So we want the workload to spin up in the same zone if possible. To make this work from a queue perspective, nothing much needs to change. We just set up our right flavors with the right labels and Kubernetes and queue takes care of the rest. In this case, we spin up two new node pool in zone C and zone A, for example. After some time has passed, we can see that all our jobs that we ran has finished. If we look at our cluster queue, we will see that our queue is completely empty with no admitted workload and no pending workload. And if you take a look at our nodes, we should see that all the spots and on-demand VMs that were created to run this workload has gone because we're no longer using them. We're back to only using our reserved instances and our six default node pools that are used generally for system workloads. In the next video, we're going to cover how to collect and visualize metrics from queue and other parts of your batch platform. In the meantime, if you'd like us to cover other topics in this space, please leave a suggestion in the comments below.